It's Triple Source Advocate, and I'm back with another video. And I'm going to cover a topic that I actually covered last year, uh, you know, pretty around this time, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I was looking for a solution that would give me an alternative to using something like TeamViewer or AnyDesk or go to assist or any of those other things that you know I, you know trust is is a big thing to me as you guys should know by now i love to self host things and i was i've been looking for something for years and people would always say vnc well vnc is okay don't get me wrong but vnc it's hard to send a file to someone and then have them be able to let me connect to them without doing port forwarding and some other stuff and i know there's some options to do that but a lot of them were windows only kind of options and it it just made it tricky uh, to get them going so i was really looking for something similar to team viewer or any desk but something that was open source and self-hosted and so i posted on the self-hosted reddit and somebody pointed out remotely and at the time he mentioned hey just be aware the developer said he's going to be taking a break for a little while and uh, this is the developer jared he's he's he he does just tons and tons of work on this project and he does you know slow down and take breaks now and then i think he's got a full-time job um so this is a this is a side project for him but he's really awesome he, he has just been tremendous in answering questions when I had him. He has a space out on Reddit as well, but this is the GitHub space, and you can see there's issues. He, he looks at issues and takes them on. And you can see 16 days, you know, a few days, a few months. So he makes updates fairly regular. I mean, but you can see that there's some changes. He's been going through a lot of change uh, lately with this uh, project. So last year when I showed it, it had a very different user interface. Um, so so he's going to be um you know updating the interface but he says the repo is on pause so i'm going to again put it out there he he puts it on pause as he needs to this is just one of those things when you make a big project that gets popular sometimes you have to stop and take time for yourself so you know understand it's out there and it functions but he'll work on it as he has time um and he does i see him get out there and do things but uh, be aware it's out there but i wanted to talk about it because he has changed the user interface a little bit so if you go to remotely.1 you can kind of test it out and see how it goes you can try to use it you can send people to it and tell them to, you know go get the, the desktop app and then give me the key and i can get connected and it's really a cool project um, so i've got my own version of it set up but i want to go through the setup with you guys today because it's really not too complicated but it does take a little bit of experience um, i do suggest <clears throat> so there's two ways to run this you can run this on bare metal and if you're going to run on a vps i highly recommend just running it bare metal on the vps i, I hate to say bare metal on the vps because it's, it's already a virtual machine but i highly recommend just running it installed on the operating system there but there is also a, uh, a docker application for it that's been created um, and it works well i've i've installed it in in the past and, and used it so there's two ways to do this um, today i'm going to show both of those ways so if you want to jump to one or the other feel free i'll put time timestamps down in the show notes but first we're going to go out and we're actually just going to install it straight up on a vps I want to say thank you to all of my patrons over at Patreon and my subscribers on YouTube. Thank you so much for all of your support. I love doing this channel. I love making this media and this content for you. I hope you enjoy it as well. I do post all of the videos now over at Patreon after one of my patrons made the suggestion, and I don't know why it didn't dawn on me before that. But if you're interested in seeing them through Patreon and getting notifications through Patreon instead of through YouTube or hoping that YouTube's algorithms happens to show it to you, jump over and become a supporter on Patreon, patreon.com. I've got the links in the description and the show notes. I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to go out to DigitalOcean. That's my, my VPS uh, that I prefer for testing stuff. So once you're in DigitalOcean, if you haven't signed up before, just understand I do have an affiliate link down in the description. That is something that will give me a credit, but it also gives you a credit if you sign up for DigitalOcean using that link. So you'll get a $50 credit for 30 or 60 days. I don't remember exactly what it is, but it gives you a chance to get out here and try their droplets, um, which is what they call their virtual machines. So um, when you go here, if you go to create, we'll go to, to a droplet. Um, it's pretty easy. You pick the, the the distribution you want, and they've got several. I always use Ubuntu, and 2004 is the latest uh, LTS long-term uh, support. So I just use that one. Um, when you go down here, choose a plan. So they have uh, basic, they have general purpose, you know, all these different things that you can click on. I always click on this little left one here, and then you see it changes to $5. So I'm going to use a $5 a month droplet. So really, really inexpensive. So with that credit, you could run like 10, 10 of these things, five of these, you know, and you can do the math. So I'm going to use a $5 droplet and then pick a place that's geographically close to you. 
so I'm going to do that as well. New York's fine. I'm in the middle of the country in the United States, so that's perfectly good. And then if you have SSH keys, you can upload those and name them. So I'm just going to go ahead and use this one right here. That's the machine I'm on. And don't worry about that. That's my public key, so there's nothing you can do with it except give me access to something you probably wouldn't want me to have access to anyways. And then here... Now you can name this. This is going to create the host name of your of your virtual machine. So I like to name it what I'm actually going to to use as the full URL. So I'm going to call this remote.osia.me. So os open source is awesome.me. We'll just use that for now. And then everything should be good. I'm going to click create droplet. And it's going to take just a second. Now, I want to actually have remote.osia.me point to this droplet and it's going to get a public IP address here in a minute. So I'm going to go out to my registrar. I'm going to go to godaddy.com. So in order to get this to point to the server that I want, I'm going to click on add right here under under the under the DNS records and I'm going to go here and I'm going to pick an A record and I'm going to type in remote because that's the name that I used as the subdomain. And I'm going to go back to DigitalOcean. It should be done creating my droplet here and it is I'm going to copy that IP address and I'm just going to paste that right here. And then with GoDaddy, I just go to custom, and then I just take out the three, and that means in 10 minutes, 600 seconds, this should be ready to go. So I just check and make sure remote is pointing to that IP address, and it looks like it is, which is great. Now from here, we gotta go command line a little bit here, but that's cool, we can do that. That's no problem. I'm gonna resize this window. So I'm gonna SSH, and it's gonna be root at that IP address. It's going to ask if I trust that key, and I do, and then it should have my SSH keys, so I'm done. Now, if you set it up with a password on DigitalOcean, it'll prompt you for the password, so just type in that password to get logged in. I'm going to clear out the screen here. I'm going to make the font a little bit bigger for you guys on mobile devices. So the first thing I always do with any of my Linux servers is I update and upgrade. So you can do sudo, oops, if you spell it right, sudo apt update, and then two ampersands and then sudo apt upgrade dash y. So that's going to go through and update the repositories and pull down the latest information that's available for this system. And then it's going to go ahead and run through a quick upgrade to update all of the all of the system files and everything like that and get it on the newest possible version that we can get for Ubuntu 2004. All right, after I finish upgrading everything, I always like to let it reboot. So we're doing that and I'm going to log right back in. I'm going to try to use the URL that we set up. There we go. Everything looks like it's working there. It should log me in. All right, so we're in. Now, the first thing we need to do is go get the software that we want to run. So we're going to go over to the GitHub page here for Remotely. And I'll put these links in the description and in the show notes on how to do this. And we're going to go over to uh, this section that says Releases. You just want to click into the latest release. So you can see here it was May 19th, so a little over a month ago from the date that I'm recording here. And you want to go down and find the right installer. So if you're going to run this on a Windows server, you want to get the server installer.exe, the Linux x64.zip if you want to kind of build it yourself, and then the Win x64.zip if you want to build it yourself, and then of course there's source code if you want to build it yourself as well. But really, if you're running on a Linux server or Ubuntu server like me, just, just grab this uh, one that has no extension. You're going to right click, you're just going to click on copy link. We're going to go back to our terminal. And we're going to use wget, and then we're just going to paste that in. And with with the terminal, I always use Control Shift and V, like Victor, <laughs> not C. Uh, we'll do wget again. Control Shift V. There we go. And that paste what it paste whatever you have copied to the clipboard. And you can see the version there. So we're just going to hit go. So that downloaded our installer. And if we clear this and do a, a ls, we can see there's our installer. So now we're going to do chmod, and then we're going to say plus x, which means make this executable. And then we're going to start typing out the name of that and hit tab, and it'll autofill. And we're going to hit enter. So we're going to change this to an executable file. All right, now we're just going to run that command that we just gave ex <laughs> execute permissions. And the first thing it's going to ask is, do you want to have this set up with your server already set in the download packages? If you do, you need to have a GitHub account. You'll have to set up a personal access token and do a few other things. But for me, I can easily tell my clients how to type in the URL that they need in order to access my site. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say I want to use the pre-built in this case. If you don't, if you want to have that other stuff done, then, then, you, then type no and you can go through and have it build up all the stuff for your server. 
what directory I'm just going to use the one that he suggests slash var slash www slash remotely and then in slash my server's public IP address or, or URL in this case I'm going to use os uh, remote dot osia dot me this is the URL that I set this is the host name and this is what's pointing to this server and then it wants to know what server do I want to use. In this case, I'm going to use Nginx. That's what I'm used to, and it's on Ubuntu. It's going to get the pre-built server package. It's going to download that thing, and then it should install it for us. And everything should be done, except for Let's Encrypt is going to prompt us for some information uh, as it gets to that point. So this uses .NET Core in order to run, so it's going to go out and grab some of those packages as well with this install script, and it's going to install the .NET Core stuff that it needs on the server. And there we go. So we're being asked for our information for uh, getting set up for Let's Encrypt, so I'm going to put in my email address I want it to use. And this is going to ask if you agree to their terms of service. Just click agree if you do. And then it wants to ask if you're willing to share your email address. I've already done this, so I'm going to hit end, but you can hit yes. So what sites would you like to activate HTTPS for? So I'm just going to press one because there's only one option for me in this case. But if you have more than one, you can pick more than one. Finally, it's going to ask, do you want to redirect any unsecured traffic through HTTP over to HTTPS, which I do. So I'm going to press 2. And then now you can see everything is done and it is complete. So we should be able to go to our URL now. If we go to remote.osia.me, there it is. So this is my first uh, site, so I'm going to set up and I'm going to say register because I'm not registered yet. And I'm going to put in my email address. There it is. Now I auto-filled the password. I want to make sure I get a password I can remember and know. And then we're going to click on register. And it can, it'll ask if you want to save it, if it's, your, if it's set up in your browser correctly. So here you get kind of the nice overview of what you can actually do inside of Remotely. It's really actually pretty awesome. So you get this home, and if you have saved machines here, you'll see those listed here. If you're going to do a remote control session, you can click this, and it opens up in a new tab, which is nice. Um, so you can put in your name as the support person, and then the other end, the person on the other end, will give you their ID. And then over here you've got a list of tools that you can use. Um, to help get through what's going on on that machine and help you control that machine. So we'll go through controlling the machine here in just a minute. I'm going to close that down for a second. So here's your downloads. And this tells you like, hey, if you want this, you know, to function in a certain way, you have to go, you know, again through the GitHub Actions. But these are your installable instant support clients so that something can be installed in their machine. So I like to have them download the, the portable support client. So they have Windows 64-bit. Windows 32-bit, and then Linux. Now, Linux runs on several different distributions, so you have to kind of test it out on different ones to see what it'll actually run on these days, but I know for sure it'll run on Ubuntu. And this is a Ubuntu executable. Now, the other thing you have is these um, resident agents. So this is something you install on a machine to be able to get control of it anytime you need control of it. So if you're an IT administrator and you have a team of IT people and they're constantly trying to um, control, you know, take control of machines and do things on them, control your servers, things like that, you've got some great options here. And when you install these things, that's what would show up here on this dashboard so that you can take control anytime you need to and, and kind of check those out. Now, you can create scripts that you can then just utilize while you're logged into other people's uh, machines so that you can run stuff in a hurry and kind of have it saved. You can have device details and device ID information. You, of course, have user options, so you can set up some user options there. You can set up organizations and manage your organization. 
You can do a little bit of rebranding, so you can brand things and make it look a little bit different or a little bit better. Um, you can kind of set it to your own brand instead of using the remotely brands, which is really nice. This is a cool feature. Um, honestly, being open source, I would expect this to almost be like a paid feature because it's really a, a nice feature, and it, it just to me, I think this this should be something you could you could pay for actually. Um, API keys. So if you want API keys to write to an API for this, you can get them. You have server logs, so you can see what's going on on the server as well to make sure things aren't happening that are kind of strange. So this one here says MIME kit, so we've got some kind of MIME kit error that's happening. It's not affecting the server so far, so we're looking okay. We do have server configuration as well, so as far as server admins go and things like that, you can do quite a bit here from the server configuration side. You have application settings, you just have a lot of stuff here in the config, so you can just kind of scroll through and make changes and updates. So you have SMTP setup that you can do, so you can get email information uh, sent out as well. You have themes, so you have dark and you have light. Um, and I think if you save, then it will change that. So just be aware you do have themes. You have trusted cores origins. So if you need to have cores, the cross origin uh, stuff set up, you can. HSTS, uh, WebRTC, I like to check because that makes it do a peer-to-peer -peer connection whenever it can. And then of course you have connection strings and things like that that you can also use. So if you click on your own account, you can manage your account here. So you've got the username, you can put in a phone number for your users, you can put in your users email addresses if they don't have it. You can set and change their passwords. You can set up two-factor authentication and I highly recommend this because you don't want somebody taking over your system. So having two-factor authentication as yourself as an admin is really useful as well. And forcing your users to have two-factor authentication is great. Um, and then of course any personal data that you want to store on here, they can download or they can delete it, which uh, I think will help with uh, the European side of things where, where they have uh, data restrictions. So of course you have account and logout over here, but you can always go back to the remotely side just by clicking on the logo there. So if you have a lot of machines listed, it'll limit it to 25, you can change that, and of course you can search the machines right here as well. So that's really getting the server up and running if you're running it just on a bare VPS. The next thing I want to do is actually take you through the install on Docker and using a Docker image to do the same thing. So we'll jump back to it here in just a minute. Let me get set up for Docker. All right, we're going to install this thing through Docker. And here we've got the translucency slash remotely image. Now, translucent S-E-A-C is what Jared uses as his uh, GitHub repository name. So I'm going to guess that this is his. Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, it looks like a pretty pretty good option there. He's got some links to his GitHub repos, his Reddit, uh, which is great. This is a great place to go ask questions. And then his website, of course. He's got your Docker run command, and then he's got a Docker compose command as well. He's got your Nginx configuration example if you want to use it. And then on down, he's got the caddy file example if you need that as well. So we're going we're gonna to go here, and, and I like Docker Compose. It's pretty great, but we've also got just the Docker command if we want to use that. Um, but we'll just grab Docker Compose here, and we're going to copy that. And then I'm going to go back to the terminal, and I've created a folder here called Remotely on the server that I use here inside my home network for all of my Docker stuff. And I'm going to do nano docker compose.yml. And then I'm going to paste in that Docker Compose information. So he's got a couple of things here. He's got services remotely, and it's going to use this image. Port forwarding, so he's got 5,000 to 5,000. I'm going to change this to 8282. 82. Just pick one that's free. Um, just in case 5,000 isn't free, pick one that's free. And only change the left side. You don't want to change the right side. This is what the container uses, and it needs to be 5,000. And then here he's got a, a volume set for remotely data, and he's got remotely data. So I'm going to save this with Control O and Enter, and then Control X to exit. And I'm just going to do MKDIR remotely data, just to make sure it's there. There we go. And then I'm going to do docker compose up hyphen D. All right, it looks like everything's done. We can do docker hyphen logs. Or do sorry, we can do docker hyphen compose and then logs. And it looks like it should be running. So we can go to our browser. 
and I used port 8282 and there we go it's up and running so I've got my register here Now this is great this is on my, my personal private IP but if I want to access this from outside of my network I actually need to set it up with nginx proxy manager to forward through to this and get some let's encrypt certificates so let's go do that so I'm gonna go back over and I'm gonna open up my nginx proxy manager and log into it here and I'm gonna click on my apps and I'm gonna click on add a new host and I just need to go find out what is the IP address of that container that I just started. So there's several ways to do that. Um, you can do that with Docker Compose or you can do that with actually just using uh, Portainer. So Portainer is a really great way to see this kind of stuff. I'm just gonna refresh my container list here real quick. There's our remotely one container. So I'm just gonna click on it. I'm gonna go down and it's it's got the 25 uh, subdomain here. So I'm just gonna use that IP address and I'm going to call this uh, remote remotely dot route me home dot org and I'm gonna leave it at HTTP I'm gonna set that to 172.25.0.1 and that's 8282 is the port I'm gonna say WebSocket support and I'm going to say cache assets and it's publicly accessible for now. Now I can block that later, but for now I'm just going to say that. I'm going to test it just to make sure I can get to it on the HTTP option. So we're going to save that. And here's my entry right here, so I'm just going to click it. And it opens up. Great. So I've got step one done. Awesome. Uh, now I'm going to go back here and I'm going to edit that entry. So I'm just going to click on the three dots. I'm going to click on edit. And then I'm going to jump over to SSL here. I'm going to say request a new certificate. I'm going to force SSL. And then I'm going to have my email address in here. If you don't have your email address when you're using Nginx Proxy Manager, go ahead and put your email address and then click that you agree to their terms and then click save. All right, so now that we've got HTTPS set, we're just going to click here. And you can see we now get logged into our remotely here locally and it's on HTTPS and it's got a valid certificate from Let's Encrypt. So we can register. And again, I'll just put in the email address that I want to use. And it gives me a password. Let's make sure it's a good strong password here. And then we'll register. And here we are, and we're inside of our remotely application that is running here locally on my network at home instead of out on the internet. So you can do this with Nginx Proxy Manager and you can run it in Docker as you saw. And this is the official image there from Lucency, which is great. Um, I'm really impressed with the remotely application. Let's try this from a Linux box. I'm having a little bit of a hard time with my Windows virtual machine. It's not wanting to do anything correctly on the internet. So let's just figure out why. Uh, looks great. Let's go to remotely.routemehome.org. And let's go to downloads. Let's get the Linux 64 bit. And we'll save that file. You can see it happened pretty quick there. Let's see, we're gonna go and close this. We're gonna go to our downloads folder. Now for Ubuntu, we have to <coughs> install a couple of things before we can actually use the quick support client. So we need to do sudo apt update. We're gonna let that update run real quick and grab some repos. And we're gonna install a few uh, dependencies here. And again, these are on the GitHub repo. I'll have that linked. But if you look down into there under the client requirements for the quick, for the quick client, you'll see this. So it makes it a little bit easier if you know that that's there. Uh, we're gonna do sudo apt install libx11 dev. We're just gonna put a space and then libxrandr-dev and then a space. Uh, lib c6 dev and then a space lib gdi plus lib xtst dev and xclip 
So we're going to say yes to install all of those things. We're going to let it go out and grab them real quick, get them installed. So once we've got all those uh, extras installed, we just we can go into our downloads folder and do dot slash remotely and just tab to get remotely desktop. Now you want to use sudo in order to run this because it's going to need sudo privileges. So we'll do sudo. And there you go. And you see it pulls up and it says in initializing. So you can see a bunch of stuff happening here in the background as it initializes and it says, hey, what's the uh, server URL? So I'm going to put in HTTPS. Let's see. Uh, HTTPS colon slash slash remotely dot route me home dot org. I'm going to hit OK. It's going to reach out to my server. And it's going to say, you know what? I need a key. So now I've got this key. OK, so I'm going to go back over to my server. And in the server, I'm going to go to my remote control tab here. I'm going to type in my name as the person who will be helping. And then I'm going to type in this key. Seven four five six four one two eight two, I believe. And I'm going to hit connect. Now you see that's going to prompt me over on this side. It says, hey, you've got a connection request and I have to say yes. If I say no, it's not going to let this person connect and it's going to disconnect us. So I'm going to say no first. And you'll see I don't ever get connected. So I'm having to switch back and forth between the screens here for you to see this, but I don't get connected. So I'm just going to close this tab. I'm going to go back. I'm going to say remote control again, and I'm going to do it again. So uh, it keeps my name, which is great, but I need to put in the key again. Now, I also want you to notice if I close this, um, in fact, let me close this first on the window side. All right. So we're going to do dot slash remotely again. Oh, sudo remotely. We'll let this thing boot up. It's going to go and it's going to say initializing again, but this time it's going to grab a new address. So you see now it's got a new number. So I can't use the same number over and over. When they kill it, it's done. And until they restart it and give you a new number, there is no reattaching. I love that. I think that's an amazing feature for somebody who's wanting some security on their system, knowing that nobody else could get on it again until they reopen the app and give them a new number. So we're going to type in this number. Five zero nine six eight eight one nine nine. We're going to hit connect, and again, it's going to prompt us the time. I'm going to say yes, and you see now I've got access over here on my remotely server, and I can move this guy around. Okay, so it's a little bit jumpy, but I can move things around. Um, it's not going to stream super fast, and it's kind of weird because I'm remoted into a remote, and I'm looking at a remote, so that could be creating issues as well. But I can go and just stop recording here on the on the Windows side now. Actually, I'm going to leave it up. Um, just give me a second. So on the Windows side, if I uncheck the little box for me, over here, I shouldn't be able to control anything anymore, and I can't. You see, I can't click anything now. So I can see what this user's doing. I can see that I'm moving it on the Windows side, but I can't actually... I can't do anything from the Linux side because they've unchecked my name. So the user has power to take away your ability to mess with their machine, which I think is a great a great tool as well, a great feature. Now if I check it again, I can come back and now I can click and I can do things from the Linux side. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Now from the Linux side, I do have the controls here. So there's view only, so I could turn that on. And when I do, see, I can't click, so it takes away my mouse. So if I'm telling the user, hey, I need you to do something, I want you to, to do it, I'm just going to watch. I can turn this on for myself so that I, I can move my mouse around on my screen and do stuff, and I'm not messing with what they're trying to do here. I'm not taking away their mouse control, which is great. I can use the clipboard to copy things around. I can block remote input. Now, I'm not sure this works on Linux, but on Windows, I'm pretty sure it works. But if I click on block remote input, See, this person still has total control. I can't block it from my side. But on Windows, I think you can actually block it. I can invite others. So if I have other users on my remotely server and I want to invite somebody else to join this session, I can do that and add extra users to the remotely session so they can see what's happening. Sometimes you need an extra person to come in. If you're a support person, you might need somebody from your deployment team, somebody from your dev team, things like that to take a look at something. So this is a really cool feature. You can turn on audio in case you need to hear something from the other side. 
Of course, you've got file transfer, so you can click there to do a file transfer. You can say upload or download, depending on what you want to do. And you can just, you should be able to click away from that, I think. Uh, maybe just click off of it again. Yeah, you just click it again to get it to go away. Um, you can do control alt delete, so you can send control alt delete to that machine. Now, I don't think that does anything on Linux, but on Windows, that's a useful tool. Um, you can, of course, disconnect from your session. Now you can set up the auto quality. You can turn it off if you don't want auto quality. You can look and see if they have multiple monitors. So you can say, I want to switch monitors right here, which is great. I'm going to turn auto quality back on. You can set it for full screen. So in this case, I don't have it full screen, but I can set it to go full screen. Now it's not very big anyways. It's already like a small screen over here, so it doesn't really help me. But if they had a screen that would have been like filling up the screen, it would work. Uh, escape yeah there we go escape out of it there okay so you've got fit so if you turn that off it'll try to you know it tries to fit it properly then you can record so you can make a recording of the screen so I can record kind of what I'm doing and how I'm doing it and I can go here and I can say you know um, I need a new terminal so I can right click I should be able to do control shift N and get a new terminal. So it opened up a new terminal on their screen and I can do LS and I can do clear and I can do CD to go back. So I can do all kinds of things. I don't think, I, oh, I do have tree installed. Look at that. So it's going to do tree, show you all the stuff that I have in my tree there. I can do CD downloads and then do tree dot slash. Let's see tree. Yeah, there we go. So you can see the tree of stuff that I have here in the downloads as well. So, I mean, pretty useful. I like that a lot. And then we can, of course, uh, stop the recording. And then I can download the recorded session right here. And I can save that file to my desktop or to my downloads folder, actually, in this case. And then I can go back and watch that downloaded session if I need to. Now, here you can see on the connection, it says that it tries to connect through uh, WebRTC. But if it's orange, it tells you that it's being relayed through your server. Now, if it can make a peer-to-peer -peer connection, I think it goes green, which tells you you've got a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection, which should be a much better connection, actually, uh, for doing all this stuff. But this is pretty great. I mean, just think about this. This is something that you probably haven't tried to do. I'm using Barrier on a machine that's remoted in from another machine, so this is going to be kind of weird with the mouse. Please ignore any weirdness with the mouse. If I grab my own mouse here, maybe it'll be better. Yeah, there we go. So if I use the mouse that's actually naturally on this machine, I can do exactly what I would expect to be able to do. I can go here and I can check out pictures, um, music, any of that kind of stuff, and I can see what all I've got. So, I mean, really cool. I like Remotely a lot. We're running it here in Docker, and we're using it in Docker using his official Docker application. Of course, if I close that terminal, um, that's going to close Remotely down because that's how it's running. But there we go. So we've got everything running there, and it's really great. And now when I'm ready... I can just come over and say, I'm going to disconnect. Thank you very much for your help, for, for letting me help you. Appreciate your time. There we go. And we've got everything up and done, and it's, it's ready to go. So I think that's really a, a great tool. Um, remotely has been so super simple to use. So Jared does take donations and he does take GitHub support if you have any options or if you have any opportunity. If you're using this tool and you're using it for business, uh, definitely think about donating to him. I donate a few dollars a month because I think it's a totally amazing tool. I wish I could afford to do more. I wish that I could afford to like just completely support the guy for doing this because it is really a great tool. I'd love to make sure that it stays open source. I, I appreciate that he open sourced it. Um, I think it's really terrific. So if you guys haven't had a chance to get out there and check it out, go check out Remotely. It's really great. I know he's got plans to do a Mac OS uh, client as well. I don't think it's out there yet, but I'm, I'm excited to see that as well. So if he can get Mac OS support and then on top of that have Linux and Windows, I mean, you want to talk about a terrific open source tool, this is the one. So definitely get out there, check it out, give it a try. If you have questions, post, come over to the discussion over on opensourceisawesome.com, discuss.opensourceisawesome.com. It's a rocket chat server where you can ask questions. I'll try to help you. Other people may try to help you if they can. Um, definitely get out there and then check out his Reddit if you have questions specifically about uh, remotely. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along on the journey with us, and I'll talk to you next time.